okay, so last time we have seen how to solve the Kantorovich problem. Okay, so the problem was you have a cost function, see, uh, two probability measure, new, new, and you would like to um, look for the minimizer of the integral of c of x y d pi y x y uh, among all probability measure pi, which are probability measure on the product product such that the projection on the first component gives mu and the projection on the second component gives mu. So, and we have seen that this is kind of a generalization of looking for uh, the Monge problem, looking for a solution of the Monge problem. And the solution, and the Monge problem is more or less the same problem, but you're, you're looking to a specific family of plants, which are plants induced by maps. So the Monge problem, so this is what we call K, and the Monge problem is to look to a map T, so the data are the same, but you look to a map T from X to Y such that T sharp mu is new, so you are moving uh, the measure mu onto the measure new, and such that This is minimum among all map among all map which are pushing forward new onto new, and this is what we call the Monge problem. So, okay, these are our two problems, and what we have seen is that Kantorovich problem actually has a solution. <coughs> While Monge problem is not so clear that it has a solution, right? We have some counterexamples, so that not always it has a solution. And what I would like to do today is to show when it has a solution. But uh, we have seen that to solve Monge problem, first we have to solve Kantorovich problem, and then then we have to understand which is the geometry of the support of uh, an optimal plan, so a solution of the Kantorovich problem. So we have seen last, last time that there exists a solution. This is pretty simple. And then we have seen that the support of this solution is contained in the uh, in the super C super differential of this way of a C concave function. So probably last time I always say the sub C sub differential here. In, instead of C super differential, it's OK. Um, because I'm used to work with convex function, not with concave function. So, but it's OK. <laughs> So we, we I, at least I define the object in the right way. So <laughs> it's just a matter of names. So this is the set of Y such that the map um, to Y such that the map Z to U, uh, phi of Z minus C Z Y as a maximum. Okay. So, and um, if you want, there is a more nice geometric interpretation, but more or less geometric interpretation of this set. And this, uh, so you know that uh, I mean, by the definition of C concavity, a function u is C concave if it's the infimum of cost functions. Right, of cost shade function. So being an infimum, and we have seen that um, being an infimum, it means just that its graph 
if that is touched from above by cost functions. So these are functions of the form c dot y1, c dot y2, and so on, right? So here, this is a u, p, is a function of x. So I'm looking to this. So I fix a y. I take a cos, a cos function, uh, c, c dot y. So I look just y, as y is fixed. And then I move it down, and I know that it it's going to touch uh, the graph of phi at some point. And uh, so the, if I touch in the point x1, let's say, then what I know is that y1 is in the C sub differential, super differential of phi. So this is the relation. When you take a y, you look to the cost function C of xy, as a function of x, y fixed, you move it down until you touch the graph of u, and the point where you touch is the point is the point x to which that y belongs to the subdifferential of. Okay. So if you think to a concave function, this is actually what is the real superdifferential. You take a plane, you move it down, and when the point where you touch is the point where that slope is a supporting slope. Okay. Okay, so we have seen these, and now we have also seen there was a pretty simple lemma that in case you know that pi is supported on a graph, then pi is induced by a map. Okay, so if this plan is supported on, a, is concentrated on a graph, then it's uh, induced by a, by a map. So, and I gave you an heuristic argument in the case, so everything here is in the highest generality, possible generality, but then as I told you last time, to prove theorem you need assumption. So we are going to work like on a REN or on a Riemannian manifold from now on. And um, so X and Y will be like or open subset of a REN or Riemannian manifolds. So um, I gave you an argument which was wrong but morally right to show why you expect or when you expect the, the support of pi to be included in a chi super differential of a C concave function. And the argument was simple, was like, okay, imagine that C is smooth. So actually, you just need C1 to, do this, to run this argument. So say C is C1. And then you know that if a point x, y, so if a point y belongs to the C sub differential of phi point x, then you know, you see that this function is a maximum at that point. So if you differentiate, I mean, in the maximum point for a, I mean, in the maximum point, the gradient is 0. So you get that the gradient of phi of x equals gradient of x c of x y. And if you can assume, which is just an assumption you put on the cost, that you can invert this relation. I mean, you can find, the, you can uniquely determine y by this relation. This gives that, this gives that uh, the, the wall c super differential is a graph. But actually, what is failing here is that you don't know that you can differentiate phi. Okay, phi is just an infimum of cost function. So it's an infimum of C1 function or infimum of C infinity function. But you don't have, I mean, you don't have a uniform. No, you have to. You actually have. But so the point, an infimum of C1 function cannot be better than Lipschitz, right? Take even C1 function, check, take C1 function with uniform C1 norm, and infimum is going to be Lipschitz. So no hope. And even if the function are C infinity with a bounded C infinity norm, and you take an infimum, you can you can get uh, you cannot get better than Lipschitz. So 
to, at least you cannot get a C1 function. Okay, there could be corners. So what is the point? Uh, the point is that you get a Lipschitz function, and Lipschitz function are differentiable in a lot of points because a lot of points with respect to the Lebesgue measure, right? This is the Rademacher theorem. So in some sense, I can run this argument, but I just have to throw away uh, some bad points. But if I throw away points, I have to be have to be careful that I'm not throwing away points where, which my measure sees. I mean, if there is just one point where you are, the function is not differentiable and my starting measure is a mu, sitting, is a delta sitting at that point, it's clear that I cannot throw that point, to throw away that point. So I need that uh, if I throw away a Lebesgue measurable sets of points, a Lebesgue, um, Lebesgue negligible sets of points, I need that this is a mu negligible set of points. So I just have to ask that mu is absolutely continuous with the Lebesgue measure. So the theorem, so you take, say, x and y open bounded subset, subset of Rn, uh, mu, which is absolutely continuous with respect to the Lebesgue measure, mu, uh, mu is just the probability measure. I'm, I have no assumption on you. And then I ask that my C cost, my cost C is say C1. And that I can uniquely determine Y by a relation like that. So that the map Y into grad X C XY is injective. And this is usually referred as a twist condition. Never understood why, but I think it came from the dynamical system. But I don't understand the reason of twist. Probably because you have y and x. But no idea. So this is a twist condition. Then you have all these assumptions. Then there exists a unique solution to the Kantorovich problem. So I'm saying that there exists a unique plan that this plan, uh, unique solution of the Kantorovich problem, and it is given by a map So I have a unique solution of the Kantorovich problem. This solution is also a solution of the Monge problem. And I can also write it down. So the map is just this. So T of u equals um, grad x c minus 1. So here I'm inverting this function as a function of y for x fixed. And then I compute it grad phi of x. And phi is the Kantorovich potential. Is the Kantorovich potential. So a Kantorovich potential for the problem. So it depends on the data. Okay. Okay. So the proof is essentially the one I gave you, the proof of existence. So. Proof is the one I gave you because you know that phi is Lipschitz. This is a pretty easy exercise that with this assumption phi is Lipschitz. So there exists a set A through the denets such that LD of x minus A is 0 and uh, phi is differentiable. every x in a. So if you have these, you also obviously, well, obviously, you have these by our assumption. And if you have these, you have these 
for every admissible plan atom. So, so now you take the optimal plan pi bar, you know that is included in the C sub differential. So let me be short here. So this is the graph of the C sub differential of phi for some phi, which is C concave, super differential. And then now you know that you can run the argument I did before for every x in y, in a, sorry, right? Because for x in a, phi is differential. If you have a function which is differentiable and there's a maximum, then the gradient is zero and so on. So I know that the part of pi which is above a is a graph, okay? So the argument, is, so the argument I did before tells you that the sub, I mean, that pi, let me be put quotation mark here, pi over a is a graph, right? Which is the right formal way to say that pi of x times y minus a times, uh, yeah, here I'm losing a dimension. Minus uh, a times y, so pi. Um, oh, so the right way to write to this is that pi is concentrated on a graph. So sorry, graph of t is zero for some function t, right? Because you know that you are a graph over a set, and you know what that. So it can happen that you have here a vertical part, say, right? Which is actually what happens, but you know that this point is non negligible, so you don't really care, okay? So this is like the C, this is the support of pi, the one I draw, which is, say, included. Eh? And you can have some part where you are not a graph, but actually, this part is negligible, okay? So it has a negligible projection, that's the idea. So this is the way you prove the existence, and the fact that the map is given by this is given by the argument I did before. So let me prove existence. Uh, sorry, let me prove uh, uniqueness. Okay. So we prove existence. I told you that there was a kind of... Uh, I mean, there is always a small program when you ask yourself kind of a variational problem, which is existence, uniqueness, and properties of the solution. Okay, this is the three basic question. Let's see, and so we have existence in this case. For uniqueness, uniqueness is a nice argument. So I was claiming more before, right? I was claiming that there is a unique solution to the Kantorovich problem. And why there is a unique solution to the Kantorovich problem? Well, the reason is that this argument shows that every optimal plan is concentrated on a graph. Not just that there is an optimal plan which is concentrated on a graph, okay? And which would be sufficient to prove the existence of, the Monge, uh, of a solution to the Monge problem. But I mean, here you get more. You get that every optimal plan is concentrated on a graph. And if you know that every optimal plan is concentrated on a graph, you have automatically uniqueness. And the reason is this one. Suppose you have two solutions, pi y, pi 1 and pi 2 solution of k. You know that there exist two maps, t1 and t2, such that pi 1 lives on the graph of one map, and pi 2 leads on the graph of the other map, right? But now, remember that the problem is convex in pi, or well, it's actually linear in pi, right? So pi 1 plus pi 2 over 2 is a solution as well, right? If these are two solutions, this is a solution as well. But this cannot be the solution induced by a map, unless these two maps are the same, right? Not 
be induced by a map. Right? Because you say you have the graph of T1, the graph of T2, and what I'm saying here is that the point is, and so what is doing this plan, pi1 over plus pi2 over 2, is sending this point x half here and half here. Okay, so it's not, obviously, not given by a, by a map. Okay? Okay, so let me state an important corollary, well, I mean, which is just a particular case of this theorem, but I like it. Why well, I like it? Not only me. Which is, uh, Luigi has shown that the cost, uh, I mean, is trying to show you that the co when the cost is induced by um, the distance squares, so you have a lot, uh, when the cost is the distance square on a Riemannian manifold or on a metric space and so on, is you have a lot of geometric uh, properties of the space which are given by, I mean, which are encoded in the optimal transportation problem. So let me, let me show you what happens when the cost is the distance square on array. So, okay, corollary is the theorem, is actually, let me call it the theorem, because it's all the dignity of a theorem, is a theorem which is due to Brenier, and is that if C, so the, the, the assumptions are the same as before, so C is the distance squares, the distance square on Rn, and then you have your probability measure, mu, which is absolutely continuous with respect to the bag, mu, which is a generic probability measure, x and y, which are open, sub, open, well, let's say bounded sets of Rn. Then there exists a unique T such that uh, solving the Monge problem. And this, we, this is what we have proved before, right? Because C satisfies the assumption of the theorem. So C is smooth, as you want. It's analytic. And uh, the gradient of, uh, and it satisfies the twist condition. Okay. So there exists a unique solution. See, yes. And this solution, that's what I would like just to point out, is given by the gradient of U which this time is different from phi, because usually I exchange u at phi, but this u is not phi. u is convex, plain convex, okay? It's a convex map. And uh, you also have this uh, Monge-Amper type equation. So the determinant of the action of u equals, uh, wait, here I need something. So up to now, I know just that mu is absolutely continuous with respect to the bag measure. So if also nu is absolutely continuous with the bag measure, so if mu, you can write mu as f dx and nu as g dy, meaning that there are densities with respect to the bag measure, then this map is a solution of this equation, which is uh, F over Z composition value. Okay? So kind of U solves a PD, which is a Monge-Ampere type PD. So then I give you some comment in which sense this PD is satisfied. Okay? Because when I'm going to talk about regularity, it's important to understand which is the sense in which this PD is satisfied. Okay. So the proof is, which is actually not a proof, but it's just using, yes. Sorry? No, it's an assumption. If, yeah, in these two parts of the theorem, then I assume that nu is also absolutely continuous with the back measure, and I get this additional conclusion. 
So I mean it's the interesting case in some sense. Huh? Okay. The proof Okay, the proof of part one is the previous theorem. Okay. So this one was proved before. Just notice that we are in the hypothesis of the previous theorem. So for proving two, you know by the previous theorem just that T is given by grad X C of X going to be the cheapest proof, but at least grad phi, where phi is C concave. But now what is this map? So you know C of X, Y is X minus Y over two squares. So when I take grad X, C of X, Y is just X minus Y, right? So here, if you do all the computation, you're writing x minus grad phi of x, okay? For phi, which is c concave, sorry, not concave, c concave. So what I'm claiming, okay, for sure, this is the gradient of x squared over 2 minus phi. And so the only thing I have to prove is that if phi is C concave, where C is the cost over there, then X square over two minus V is convex, okay? And this is an exercise for you since, I mean, it's just playing with soup and inf, okay? Nothing else. You just write what is, what it means that V is C concave, that is an infimum of cost function, so on. X square minus V will be a soup of something you're going to cancel the x square, and you get that you are the supremum of linear function, okay? When you expand the square here, you have x squared, then you have something which is linear in x, then you have a constant, I mean a function of y, which is a constant in x. So this is here just to kill the x square, and you get a linear, okay? So one, two, three. Well, three, the proof, the real proof, needs some, I mean, the, the proof is straightforward. The, the tools you need are not straightforward. So let me do the proof in case that T, which is, I recall, grade of U, is injective and smooth. Which, there, are, there is no reason for this to be true. And this is ex exactly the problem, okay? So, if, let me put, proof three only in this situation, but then it's simple because knowing, we recall that uh, mu was fdx, mu was gdy, so knowing that mu equals mu is the same that's saying that for every test function, you have that this equality holds. Um, P of y, g of y, dy, and just writing down what is the relation of pushing forward, and then you just change variables here, you get the y, get u of x, and if you do everything right, that here we have g of grad u of x, and here you have the determinant of the action of u in the x. So you have that this equality holds for every, let me go in a different way test function because psi was pretty important thing. For every test function psi. Okay, say psi, well now I am in a rand, but it's continuous and bounded. Now you see that if u is injective in some sense, you can cancel out. I mean, the, the test function is arbitrary. But when you compose the test function with u, is not, you are not sure that you are getting an arbitrary function, right? If, you, if grad u would be constant, for instance, this relation is not going to tell you. I mean, you cannot, when you have that relation like that for a lot of test function, then you know that it becomes a pointwise relation, right? 
but uh, you need to use the arbitrary of the test function. And uh, now we have a test function which is psi composed with gradu, so you need it, it to be arbitrary. And if, let's say, gradu is injective, this is true. Okay. So, so you have a lot of test function, and you can say that f equal g composition gradu to the determinant of the And this, this proves the wall brenier theorem. So a comment on this last part. So this proof is correct, but the point is that okay, maybe it's a remark I'll give you later. Yeah, when I start to to do the regularity part, so next time I'll make this remark more precise, probably. Okay. So, in some sense, you need to understand what is this, okay? When you have a convex function, which is not C2, what is this Hessian? And there are several ways to define the Hessians, which are stronger or weaker, it depends, I mean. And uh, I will show you that this is a pretty weak relation. And this is important because you would like to use this relation to get regularity of your map. Right, because, I mean, now you know that the optimal map is the gradient of the convex function, which is solving an equation like that, which is a PDE. So you can hope to get regularity. But I'll show you that uh, without, I mean, in, at this level, even though f and g are smooth, you cannot get regularity. Because this determinant of the Hessian is a too weak object. If I write down the determinant of the Hessian I get from this argument. Okay, then I show you with under some assumption, the support, you get more, okay? But it's just to comment that this derivation, when you make rigorous this derivation, then you see what is the right object and you see that that object is really weak. It's like a pointwise uh, derivative, okay? You know that a pointwise derivative cannot encode too much information on the function. Think, think to the Cantor function which is pointwise derivative zero as a constant function, which is the best, constant, the best function you can think of. But it's, it's a devil's state case, so it's a mess. <laughs> but um, yeah, so in that point, you have just the pointwise derivative, which is not that good. Okay. Uh, okay. One remark, which is probably stupid, but I like it also this. So we have seen that t is gradient of u, in case the cost function is x, x minus y square, it's gradient of u, for u convex. Okay, if someone of you is like a geometer, can argue that gradients are not maps. Okay, gradients are vector, not maps. So in Rn you have this mess that vectors and maps, I mean points and vectors, you can kind of confuse it, but the gradient, whatever it is, has to leave, I mean, has to be a vector, okay, not, uh, not a point. So, so here, the right way was the one I was writing, uh, writing before, which is x minus gradient of phi for phi, which, so we have seen that we have got this, huh? that phi, which is c concave. And now this is the right expression, because this is a point, this is a vector, and you, if you sum to a point a vector, this is a translation, and this is a map, okay, from our ren to our ren. And a very fancy way to write down this expression is saying that this is the exponential in x, x, where x, x of a vector v is just x plus v. And this is the exponential, exponential function in the sense of Riemannian geometry uh, in Rn. okay? It's just sending uh, a vector v to the point which is on the geodesic starting from x with velocity v at m1. And this is the same which is going to happen on the Riemannian manifold. Okay, but 
yeah, it was just a comment to prepare the theorem. But before the theorem, it, not a real break, but a mathematical break. I will show you how to apply all this. I mean, up to now is just theory. So let's give a nice application of this theory. Okay? Showing to you why, for instance, it can be interesting and useful to solve the Monge problem. Then I'll give you an idea how to write the equivalent theorem on a Riemannian manifold. So the equivalent of Brenier theorem. But first, let me recall what is the isoperimetric problem. Well, you know, you probably know isoperimetric. So isoperimetric problem is among all domain with fixed volume, you look to the one which has the smallest perimeter, right? And you know that the solution is a ball. Everyone knows that the solution is a ball. Probably even your grandmother and so on, right? If you ask which is the best way to, if to, which is the same, right? If you give to someone just a fixed amount of rope and you ask it to make the highest possible area, it's going to draw a, a circle, okay? So, so the isoperimetric problem is saying that among all sets E, such that the measure of E is the same measure of the unit ball, then the perimeter of E is going to be greater or equal than the perimeter of the ball of radius one, okay? And actually it turns out that to prove this uh, is not completely easy. Because th there is a very nice mistake behind the uh, kind of proof of this. So if you know that there exists a solution, this solution is the ball. But, uh, I mean, uh, the, one of the most famous proof, which was the Steiner proof, was like, if you know that this, there is a solution, then the solution is a ball. But it was not, it's not, it was not trivial at all to prove that there is X in a solution. And the problem is like in the definition of these sets, okay? And this is what more or less Camille is, I mean, not more or less, but through that path you can get a solution of this problem. But I'm going you how to prove this problem, I mean, to, how to solve this problem in like three lines. Okay, and this is a proof due to Gromov. Okay, so you have a set he which is doing this, and let me take two me probability measure. One is the Lebesgue measure restricted to he, and let's say I divide, since I'm working with probability measure, but it's not important. And nu is just the Lebesgue measure on the unit ball normalized again, okay? And then, when you have this, you look to t, uh, which is the gradient of the convex function, u, which is pushing forward t onto mu. Okay? And uh, this is given by Brenier theorem, this map. So this is the map given. So by the way, Brenier theorem is, uh, came later than the proof of Gromov. Gromov used a different map. But with Brenier map is even easier. So u is convex. So this, we saw that the uh, u is going to solve this equation, which was what? Uh, so with the notation I put before is like one characteristic function of e over the measure of e divided characteristic function of b of composition with grad u over the measure of b. So these two measures are the same, so they cancel. And then you see that when x is in E, this is one, and gradient of x is going to belong to, to B, right? So since, since gradient is pushing forward mu onto nu, and nu lives in, in B1, this means that for every, or almost every, 
x in E, grad u of x belongs to B1, right? Because you have to push one measure to onto another so you cannot go outside. You cannot have a lot of points which are sent outside because otherwise that measure is going out. The measure living on that point is going outside. So, so you know that this is one almost everywhere in E. Okay. But since it's one almost everywhere on E, just let me do this. So that point is one, so I can say that N is equal to n times 1, which is equal to n times the determinant of the action of u to the 1 over n. OK? So this is true in E, OK? Inside E, I know that this is 1. So if I take the 1 over n square root, this is still 1. And uh, so this is true. Now. This is what, what is this? This is just n times the product of the eigenvalue of the Hessian, right? The Hessian is a symmetric matrix and it has positive eigenvalue because the function is convex, okay? So lambda i are positive and lambda i are eigenvalue of the Hessian of u. But now this, you have the, this is a uh, geometric mean, and this is going to be less or equal than n times the arithmetic mean. Right? And here you are using that these things are positive, okay? The geometric arithmetic mean works for positive number. So now I cancel n. And this is what? This is the trace of the Hessian. Right? This is the sum of the eigenvalue. But the trace of the Hessian is nothing else than the divergence of gradient of u. If now I look to gradient of u as a vector. Okay? Okay, so you have all this inequality and you just integrate it. So you know that this equality holds true in E. Okay, so let us integrate it on E. And we get N times the measure of E is less or equal than the integral over E of the divergence of gradu, right? But now, use divergence theorem, you say that this is equal to the integral of the boundary of E of gradu dot nu. Okay, this new, we call N, N, which is the exterior normal, okay? It's just the Hausgren theorem. But now this is less or equal than the supremum of the gradient times the perimeter of E. And you see that the supremum of the gradient is just less or equal than one. This, because grad U is a point the ball of radius one, right? And you see that if you run the same argument on the ball, you have equality at every step, okay? This is, you are moving any, nothing. Right? This map was the map which was moving the, Lebesgue me the normalized Lebesgue measure restricted to the ball to the normalized Lebesgue measure restricted to the ball. So it's not moving anything. And you get equality all over here, and this proves, okay, if, if E is a ball, equality. I have equality everywhere. Because also in the arithmetic, obviously this is, if the, all the lambda i are equal to one, this is an equality, right? Which is, I mean, there are there were just two in, inequalities in this proof: the arithmetic geometric mean, which is an equality if the numbers are the same, and uh, this one, which is in a, an equality if the gradient goes 
uh, if, if pointwise the gradient is uh, one on the bound, uh, is modulus one when you are on the boundary of E, which means that the boundary of E is the boundary of the ball. Okay, so you have an equality everywhere, so you get that n times the measure of B1 equals the perimeter of B1. Then you put together these and these, and you remember that they have the same measure. Okay, so this with this gives you the proof. Okay. Okay, and what is nice of this proof, apart that it's just two-line proof, is that you did this inequality with just, uh, I mean, uh, two there, you have a chain of equalities with equalities, inequalities with just two inequalities, which are this one and this one, and uh, you know very well which are the equality cases in that inequality. So this is the proof, uh, probably Alessio Figalli is going to use this proof to show you something about stability of this is a perimetric inequality. In the sense that uh, you can ask what happens if, okay, I'm not solving, my set is not solving the isoperimetric inequality because it's not a ball, but it's very close to solve it, to solve the isoperimetric problem. So, it has a perimeter which is very, very close to the perimeter of the ball. Can I say that he is close to the ball? And in which, in which sense can I say that it is close to the ball? Well, you can actually do it, and this is what is going to talk you about Alessio. And, uh, but you see that the easiest is the proof of the inequality. The easiest will be to understand this stability issue. You just have two inequalities, so you just have to understand what, I, what you are losing in that two inequality. I'm not claiming that it's, <laughs> I'm not claiming that it's trivial, but I'm just saying, okay, the, the, the easier is the proof, the, the best, I mean, you, the best is your starting point, okay? And this shows you the, I mean, there were, there was no tra optimal transport pr prob, I mean, there was no optimal transport in this problem. It was just the isoperimetric problem. But using the fact that the optimal transport provides you a good map, so just essentially the only, the, the only thing you use about optimal transport is that it provides you a monotone map. A monotone, I mean, a map with positive eigenvalue moving uh, a set onto the ball. So it's like uh, you use the optimal transport problem as a tool to get a good map. Okay, this is, was the idea. So having maps is important because th these maps can be useful to prove something else. Okay, and uh, with more or less the same proof, I have. No time to do it, but with same ideas you can prove uh, uh, Sobolev inequality. Okay, using the same path, and it's a very nice proof. And for instance, it's on the notes of Ambrosio and Gigli, or on the book of Villani, and it goes like this. So. So we have seen that it's also useful to have, uh, I mean, a theory with distance square. We have seen what happens in Rn, but uh, Rich's lectures started saying that distance square is a cost which gives you a lot of inform information on the geometry of the underlying space uh, when wherever the space is, don't know, a general metric space. So I'm going to show you what happens when the space is a Riemannian manifold. I mean, to sketch at least a little bit what happens when the space is a Riemannian manifold if we can solve the Monge problem with a cost which is just a distance square. Okay, so uh, what happens? 
elements. So we have M, G, a Riemannian manifold. So I cannot give you too much reminds about what is a Riemannian manifold. So just you probably know that when you have M, G, uh, yeah, you have a Riemannian manifold, which for me is compact at this, uh, at this level. Then you have this metric G, which is the way you, it's just a, um, it's G of X is something going from the engines. Y is a scalar product, which is smoothly varying in X. So it's okay. And uh, you can associate all this stuff uh, volume measure. Okay, which is something that when you write down in charts is just the determinant of G of X, the square root of the determinant of G, this one, Dxn, okay. Uh, yeah, when you have all this stuff, you're happy. And obviously the distance between two points is just the infimum of the integral of gamma dot. So, yeah, let me write it this way. G, so what is square root of G, gamma dot, gamma dot, right? Which is the same with exactly the same proof of yesterday, of uh, Luigi did yesterday, so it's the infimum, sorry, among all curve gamma, such then gamma of x equal x and gamma, gamma of one equal y. And this is the same just by elder inequality, the infimum of the integral between zero and one of g of gamma dot gamma dot. Uh, yeah. Gamma of zero equal x equal y, and uh, I mean, just to be easier, this is just gamma dot, the modulus of gamma dot, so right? You just have to compute it in every different tangent place, space. At time t, you are in a place, you compute that modulus, then at time s, you are in another place, you compute the modulus with a different scalar product, and so on. And this is just the modulus square. Okay, just to write down this. Okay, so this infimum is the same, and this infimum is achieved. And I'm more interested in this infimum because this is achieved by constant speed geodesic. I mean, it's by constant speed curves. Okay, so give a name to this. So a constant speed, speed minimizing geodesic is uh, between x and y is the solution. So what does it mean is the solution to start is the curve, is the curve achieving this infimum, okay? And you can prove easily uh, that it solves, in charts it solves the following equation. Uh, k equal zero, where gamma i, j, k are the Christoffel symbol, which I don't even try to write it down, the name of Christoffel, I don't know, well, uh, symbols, <laughs> c dot symbols, okay, and um, Okay, it solves this, and uh, how do you get this equation? Okay, I'm not going to write 
try to, to show you, but uh, a good way to get it is to write down the Euler-Lagrange equation, and this is something I kind of need, the Euler-Lagrange equation of this function. So this is what Luigi called action functional yesterday. So So the action function is say a gamma, which is, let me call it with one half, okay? So it's square. And then you would like to understand what happens if you take a variation of gamma. So, okay, you have gamma here. Then you take a car which is very close to gamma and... You take a car which is very close to gamma, how, how big is its action? And for some reason, which I will explain you later, I also need to understand which is the action of a car which is very close to gamma, but has not the same endpoints of gamma, okay? So, our original gamma. And the idea is that since everything is local, you can write in charts, work in charts, write everything down, and you just have in some sense to understand what happens when you look to variation like that, which makes not too much sense on a manifold, right? Because you're summing, and there is no sum between points. So, okay. You can prove that this is the action of gamma. I'm not going to give you this proof. It's nice, I mean, it's a nice exercise. Times epsilon, then you have an integral of something times h, okay? And then you have epsilon times g in gamma 1, gamma dot 1 times h1 minus epsilon, uh, this minus, uh, the same thing in 0. zero, and then you have big O epsilon square, okay? And uh, clearly, so this something here takes into account the fact that, I mean, this is right down for a general curve, right? So if you, this here is like saying that you can, if you move your curve in some direction, you can lower or uh, you can lower the the action. This is something which is going to have a sign, right? Always, because h is I mean, h is arbitrary. So this something, I mean, you cannot make this thing to have a, a negative sign every time. So for a geodesic, you know, a geodesic is something which is minimizing with a, a fixed extrema. So you, if you put fixed extrema, correspond to say that h of 1 is h of 0, is 0, right? Now in this case, you don't have this part, and you see that for a geodesic, this, this has to vanish, right? The terms inside the square bracket, which I didn't write, has to vanish, and this gives you this equation, okay? It's not exactly these terms, it's like... Uh, I think is that this is these times the metric or something like that. Okay? So this term has to vanish, but these terms for a generic geodesic does not have to vanish because you are just asking that your geodesic is minimizing with fixed extrema. And it actually is pretty nice that it's pretty natural that it does not have to vanish. So think to a geodesic, okay? Think that you make a variation where h of zero is zero. So I'm just fixing the starting point. But then I don't fix the ending point. And you see that you increase the action more or less in, right? You have that this one is gamma dot of 1, and this one is h of 1. And you're looking into the scalar product 
of these things, and this is how the action is going to increase or decrease. And if you think that the action is just length, it's pretty natural, right? If you go in this direction, it's the way you are making it. You are increasing the best as possible, right? If you want to maximize this scalar product, you have to go in the direction of gamma dot. And you're, it's just the way you, you're just continuing your geodesic. So it's the way you're increasing the action. Okay, so I need this formula. And then uh, another thing I need is, okay, is the definition of exponential map, which is simply, so the exponential map from a tangent um, is a map which goes from a tangent space to the manifold, and it's just going to take a vector v to um, gamma v of 1, right, where uh, gamma v, gamma v of t is the geodesic starting with gamma 0 equal x and gamma dot of 0 equal v. So it's not a geodesic among, between two points, right? I mean, it's a geodesic between two points, but I'm not prescribing the two points. I'm just prescribing the initial position and the initial velocity. And this is okay because this is a second order ODE. So in some sense, I have to prescribe two conditions. Okay, so this is the exponential map. Just notice that in Rn is the map I wrote before, which is just taking x and summing v. And this is the Euler-Lagrange equation for the action. And with these tools, after five minute breaks, we can prove Meccan theorem, more or less. I mean, give a sketch of the proof of Meccan theorem. Okay. okay. Oh, just an errata corrige. Before I wrote this, it's the infimum among all cars of the length of the cars which are joining, uh, which are joining x and y, and this is equal to the infimum of this when I put the square root. Okay. Otherwise, it's not homogeneous in gamma. And this is actually nice because this way I can write and I'm going to use this one half the distance square among two points is just the infimum of the action of gamma, where the action is just this with one half, this without the square root, right? This is just one half the integral of gamma dot square. Okay? When the cards are there. Okay. Uh, so, yeah. Was this square root missing? Okay, so I can state now Brenier theorem. Uh, no, sorry, Meccan theorem, which is the equivalent of Brenier theorem of uh, Riemannian manifold. Which tells you that if you have as cost function is d square x, y over 2, and then uh, you have mu, which is absolutely continuous with respect to the volume measure, and nu, which is a generic measure, probably to measure on M, uh, this, this, this. Then there exists a unique solution. So the statement is the same of Brenier theorem, right? That there exists a unique solution to K. This solution.
is given by MI. So it is a solution also to the Monge problem. And you can write down this map. This map T is just X of X minus grad phi and phi is d square over 2 concave. Okay? So the statement is exactly the same we have before. And you say, okay, since the statement is the same, just run the argument you did before. But there is an issue in running the argument I did before. And the issue is that the cost is not even, is not smooth anymore. Okay, distance square on a manifold is not smooth. And the example is, uh, okay, this is something I need later. So D square, so let's say I fix Y and I look at it as a map of X is not C1. It's pretty easy to see why. So take, for instance, M to be S1. Fix a point, for instance, the North Pole, and try to do what is distance square of X from the North Pole. You can parameterize your sphere by theta, okay? And uh, if you try to write down the graph of distance square, so this is like distance square of theta okay, over two is not so important. Um, what happens that you start your distance goes like this, then you move until you reach the south pole, right? Which is pi, and then you see that uh, uh, this is a maximum from the distance, but uh, I mean, you, you don't have zero derivative. I mean, if you, if you move a, a little bit farther, you, the, your distance is increasing in the same way, right? So the distance, but it's not anymore, I mean, this geodesic is not anymore minimizing because when I'm here, it's cheaper to arrive from this this other direction. So the distance square is going to, it has like a graph like this, okay? And here is two pi. So you have an upper cusp. Uh, well, it's not a cusp, it's just an upper corner, okay? Here you have a derivative. So, so the derivative here is not infinite. It's something, okay? So you see that it is not smooth. You say, okay, but even the map phi was not a smooth map. So maybe you can throw away, so this is obviously a Lipschitz function, right? D square is uh, locally Lipschitz, but your manifold is compact, so it's globally Lipschitz. So D square is a globally Lipschitz function, you say, okay, uh, being a globally Lipschitz function, I know that for every y, it is differentiable almost everywhere. So for every y, I have a set of x, where uh, the um, distance square is differentiable in that x. So I can throw it away, but then I change y and I have to throw away another set of points and then so on. And what happens is that I can throw away a lot of points since I'm just making an uncountable union of set of zero measure. And this is actually what is happening in this example. So for every point, the point where the distance is a singularity is the opposite point. So if for every point you throw away the opposite point and then you make the union on the whole sphere, you are throwing away the whole sphere, okay? So this does not work. But what it works here is that these in some sense are the only singularities that the distance can have, okay? So the distance, uh, what I would try to show you now is that the distance has always, the, the only possible singularity for the distance are like upper crests, like this, so upper corner. It has the same singularity of a concave function. Okay, it's like a concave function plus a smooth perturbation. This is, so we have to, so the, the, okay, this is the theorem. 
kind of lemma is the following. So, so let's call uh, lemma. Let's take y in m, which is a point I think fixed look to the function f y of x to be one half distance square x y so I'm looking to this as a function of x k y is fixed then what is true is that f y of z is always so what is true is that for every x there exists p of x tangent vector such that this is true of x plus okay so what I would like here to write is something like that p of x so let me put quotation mark here zeta z minus x so the scalar product between these two plus Ego of z minus x squared. Okay, so this formula makes no sense written in this way because I'm on a Riemannian manifold and I cannot subtract two points, right? I, w I want a tangent vector. This is not a tangent vector. But the way it makes sense is the following. So it's like p of x times x to the minus one in x of z, which is the tangent vector to the geodesic starting from x and going to z and you all know since the manifold is compact it's complete so you know that there is this geodesic so this makes sense and this is just uh, scalar product it's just like metric like this and then I have something like big O of distance square and now this formula makes sense okay so but what I'm saying is just that this is not plain differentiability because I have just an, inequ an, uh, an inequality, not an equality, right? What I'm, ha what I'm saying is that in every point, distance square can be touched from above by a C1 function, okay? So it's like differentiable from above, whatever this makes sense. I mean, in this sense, it's differentiable from above. So you see that you can allow upper cusps, upper crests, like that, but you cannot allow something like this, okay? This is a forbidden singularity, because in this point, you cannot be below a linear function, right? So the only possible singularity for the distance square are singularity like the one I draw, uh, I draw here. And actually, I can also say what is this P of X. P of X is uh, mm, p of x is minus x uh, is minus x, x to the minus one of y. So recall that I have a fixed y in all this statement. Okay. So I know that p of x is the opposite of the um, so, right, I have y fixed here, I'm looking what happens in a point x, and p of x is just, uh, uh, so the vector, this would be x, x to the minus 1 y, so it's the v velocity of the tangent vector going to y, and so p of x is going to be this vector, okay? So you have like just gradients from above, not from, Sorry. Yes. yes. I think uh, with the f y of x is not differentiable as x, then the inverse of exponential mass is not well defined as one. Because uh, they are cut point. And in some sense, there, there may be two different directions correspond to the same uh, y. Uh, no, it's one off. It's not, but it's, there is not unique this P of X. 
I mean, you can have, uh, this is exactly what happens. You can have a lot of P of X. And one P of X, which is okay, is this. If you so, want. I mean, actually, in this case, the exponential inverse is not... Uh, okay, let's... You may, you may write it like the P X. The, the P X, if you want, you can write this, like... Yeah. P X belongs to exponential inverse. So you have a lot... Of, I mean, you could have a lot of possible uh, velocity, and uh, this going from a point to, to from x to y. This is what he's saying is like, uh, say that you have two geodesic, so I would have two possible velocity and two possible p of x. And they all are okay for this inequality, okay? This is exactly what is, go what is happening here. You have that uh, one slope is the slope of the, velo uh, of, the velo of the geodesic coming from this side. The other slope is the slope of the geodesic coming from this other side. And uh, here in between you have a lot of possible plants you can put above, right? And uh, the way you prove this The way you prove this lemma is just using the expansion for the energy. So you know, you have seen that the energy, uh, so the dis so we know that the distance square between two points, let's just call this y and z over two, is just the infimum of the integral of gamma dot square, right? So points starting from y and ending at z. And now, so we know this. So let's take a minimizing geodesic between y and x. So this geodesic is such that its energy, the action of this geodesic is exactly one half distance square between x and y, right? Then, I take a point z which is close to x, right? And I look to this curve here. Okay? And when I look to this curve here, this is a curve which I can write, say, in this way. Okay, think to this point to be very, very close to x. Right? So think that the distance between x and z to be like outside. Okay? And then I look to this curve, which I write in this way. And now I know that the distance square between y and z over 2 is less or equal than the action of this curve. just because this is an infimum. But the action of this curve, I know that is the action of the curve joining uh, y to a with x, right? Plus, then I have epsilon. So the, there were a term which is zero since gamma dot is a geodesic. So there were in the previous expansion, there were a term like this, and this is zero gamma dot is geodesic. And then now I don't have fixed extrema. So I have a fixed extrema in Y, but not in Z. So this is epsilon G in X of what? Um, what this would be like gamma dot, gamma bar dot of one times H of one. Right? And then I have a big O of epsilon square. Right? And then you see that this is exactly what I have here. Right? H1 is the, so you can think, this is like, you can think this as an infinitesimal variation. So H1 is just the velocity of something connecting X with Z. 
for instance, as geodesic here, I, here I put this, but it's not important, this one, right? Because this is a, like a first order expression, so you don't really care that curves are geodesic. It's just, just need to know the tangent vectors. So this is that formula there. Okay? You see that you have that, these terms there is not, this is distance square x, y, then you have this expression here. This less than this plus something which is linear plus something which is quadratic. Okay? And you have the right inequality. And you see that actually this inequality is a true inequality when you have two minimizing geodesic. Okay. This being done, we are happy. Why we are happy? Well, so let us try to prove McCantier. So we know, so we take, as usual, we take the solution of K. So we have two probability measures, the cost function, we run the Kantorovich problem, we find out the solution. We know that there exists a d square over two concave function such that Uh, such that support of pi bar is included in the. Let me write. Let me be sloppy here. Is included in the graph of the super differential, so on. And uh, what happens? Okay. Now, uh, what happens? So we know that. This set, so let's take x and y in the support of pi, so we know that y belongs to the, to this, oh, and again, phi, phi is, uh, yeah, no, I already wrote it, Bandit. So we have these, uh, once we have these, uh, we know that, again, this is such that, uh, so y is such that the function which is sending z to d square over 2 xy, uh, d square over 2 z y minus phi of z as a maximum. in x, right? This means we belong to the super differential. Okay, so this is what we have. Then we have this lemma which I erased, but we have. Okay, so we have seen that it's harmless to throw away a set of points x where phi is not differentiable, okay? So up to throw away a moon null set, I can assume phi is differentiable. Okay, so phi is differentiable, but the point is that we don't know that d is differential. But what happens here? So I told you that if a second k function, like phi, is an infimum of function of the following form. So this is distance square y for some y, right? And you see that in some sense, distance square, by the lemma I raised, distance square is c1 from above. So it always says a C1 function touching it from above, right? At least it has the behavior of a function like that. But now you see that phi 
which is our second k function, is touched from by the distance square from below, uh, from above. Sorry, phi is touched from above by the distance square, which means that phi touches the distance square from below. So you have a function which is c1 from above always, and in the point we are looking at, which are these kind of points, it's touched also from below by a function which is differential, right? So you see that here cannot be a singular point. Because if you want, geometrically it's pretty intuitive because the only singularity you allow to distance square is singularity like that. And you cannot put a smooth function touching from below in a singularity like that. A C1, not even smooth, right? So the point, the contact points between the phi, the graph of phi and the graph of distance square cannot be singularities. So this, this function could have a singularity here, and then I don't know, here, and so on. Things can be pretty nasty. But this cannot be here, this singularity, because the only singularity you allow are singularity like that. And it's impossible for a singularity like that to be touched from below by something which is smooth. So what is happening here is that, uh, what is happening here and if you want, you can try to prove it with the lemma I gave you before, is that uh, if xy belongs to the, to the support of pi and phi is differentiable at x, and we see that I'm throwing away some points this I can always assume, then uh, distance square is differentiable at x. Okay? So you see there were, just because distance square has always a smooth function touching it from above, and in this point it also has a smooth function touching it from below. So you are trapped in between two C1 functions and you have to be C1. Okay. okay. So you know what? So you know that you can run the argument, so you can differentiate. So you know that uh, you, dif you use that this is true. So you know that grad phi of x equals grad x distance square over 2 x y. And we have seen before, what is this gradient? This is just minus x, x to the minus 1 of y, right? Is the velocity of the, is the opposite of the velocity of the geodesic connecting x with y. And In this case, this is related to your observation, when you know that the distance square is differentiable, then you can also prove that there exists a unique geodesic between x and y, right? If you think to the example, it's pretty easy. If, I mean, if you have two different geodesic, they cannot, they has to have a different velocity. So you have at least uh, two slopes touching from above. Since you know that you don't have two slopes, this means that you have just one geodesic. Okay, so, and uh, so, and it's just, this is unique since it's differentiable at, y, at x, at x, and uh, and you see that, I mean, the gradient of this function cannot be nothing else that, so, uh, computing the gradient in x, cannot be nothing else that this vector, right? Which is the, the direction in which this function is increasing more, it's just continuous, if you have to continue your geodesic, if you know. And uh, so the gradient is just this, so this is the gradient x distance square y, which is, Nothing else 
that the opposite It's nothing else than the opposite of this vector, and this vector here is uh, x, x to the minus 1 of y, right? So this is the geometry, geometry behind this formula, okay? Is it clear? Okay. And, uh, okay, so you have this formula, you conclude here, now you just invert, now the inverse exponential is well defined because we have just a unique geodesic. Just invert this and you get y equal what? x x minus grad phi. Right? Which is the claim of the theorem. So you have a map and this map is given. Okay. You have a map and this map is given by given by this. Okay. So let me move now to a slightly so So we have seen that we can have I give you two measures, there are an uh, assumption under which uh, I can, I mean, I can always say, almost always, solve the Kantorovich problem, sometimes I can solve the Monge problem, but, and we have seen that even solving the Monge problem, for instance, gives us a two-line proof of the isoperimetric inequality, which is nice. So, what I would like to tell you in this 20 minutes is how to understand I mean, how to see how, how to see how can uh, if you look at the whole set of measure on a metric space and you end up with a distance which came from the induced, I mean, the distance you have. This can be geometrically and analytically meaningful, meaningful and can give you a lot of information on the underlying space. Okay, and this is what was saying Luigi at the beginning of the lectures of yesterday, in which you can, for instance, characterize manifolds uh, with uh, positive Ricci curvature in terms of the convexity of some function. Okay? And so I'll try to give you, a not, I mean, more an overview because time is time. There is not so much time and I would like to, I mean, next lecture to talk you about regularity of this maps because, I mean, it's an issue I like, mainly. <laughs> and, uh, okay. So, let's look to the following. So, X uh, is uh, our metric space, okay, but you can think it to be our Riemannian manifold, whatever. And I look, uh, maybe not comment, so I look to the space of probability measure. So this is our probability measure, which has finite second moments. But if you are compact, it's not so important for some x dots. Okay. This is something you need because I'm going to make, uh, to to use the Kantorovich problem with um, quadratic cost, and I would like things to be finite. Okay, so this is a, this is our space, and then uh, among if I take two probability measure in this space, if I take two probability measure in this space, I can define a distance which is called Wasserstein distance. So the vastest distance between mu and nu is just the infimum among all plan, which are transport plan of the integral of d square uh, d square x y d p of x y, and then since I want a distance again, I have to put the square root. Okay. So, well, okay, this is a distance, it's a theorem. 
that this is a distance, okay? I'm not going to prove this theorem. So, the, so if you want P2 of x with this distance is a complete separable metric space, if so is x, okay? So if you start from a complete, um, for a complete uh, and separable metric space and you construct the Wasserstein space over this, which is this, it's called Wasserstein space, then you get a complete and separable metric space too. And just notice that the map which associate to x in x, the delta mass sitting on x is an isometry, is an isometric immersion of x into the Wasserstein space. Okay. So what I'd like to show is that some property, we have seen that some basic property of x are uh, endowed by the Wasserstein space. What I would like to see now is, I mean, at least to sketch you uh, what is the relation in some sense between geodesic? Okay, we have seen that geodesic and probably also, I mean, geodesic are, plays the role that geodesic in a generic metric space plays the role that lines and segment plays in, don't know, two dimensional Euclidean geometry. And uh, you know, all know that you can prove a lot of nice things and you can make a lot of nice theorem just uh, with two-dimensional Euclidean geometry in the plane. And uh, I mean, in sense, understanding the geodesic of a metric space, of a space gives you a lot of hint on the, um, on the geometry of that space. Uh, Ambrosio showed you how to, I mean, how to characterize sectional curvature in terms of geodesic triangles, okay? So, I mean, geodesic's an uh, important tool in geometry. And uh, so you have a, a complete metric space and you have seen again yesterday that you, there is a well-defined notion of length, it's a well-defined notion of speed of a curve. And uh, so you can talk about geodesic in a generic metric space. So the question is, uh, which are geodesic in bus system? Can you, can you understand which are the geodesics among measure? And in some sense, uh, this is interesting because if you think, okay, I, have to, I give you two points, and you say, okay, the distance between two points is something, I don't know, three. But if I give you the geodesic between these two points, you know which is the shortest way to move from one point to another. In, sen in some sense, you are minimizing your distance. I mean, you are taking the, Time by time, you're thinking the optimal path. So here, the analogous is I give you two probability measure, I solve the Kantorovich problem, and I found out the Wasserstein distance between these two, Kantor, uh, these two probability measure. But which is the optimal way to move one probability measure to another? I mean, which is the path of, the, of particles going from one, from the initial position to the final position? And this is encoded by geodesic in the Wasserstein space. So the theorem is that if X is a geodesic space, and a geodesic space uh, is just that among every two points, there is a, um, 
not unique. There is a minimizing geodesic, okay? So among, yeah, and the distance uh, is compatible. It's like a Riemannian manifold from this point of view. So geodesic space just means that d of x, y is equal to the infimum of, uh, let me write as I need, gamma dot square to the one half among all curves going from here. So it's equal to the minimum. So I want it is the infimum and that the infimum is achieved. So this means to be a geodesic space. That there is this compatibility between curves and distance, okay? Which makes it interesting to look to geodesic. Otherwise, I mean, if you put a distance which has nothing to do with, with curves, you can do it. Actually, if you look, for instance, any Riemannian manifold, uh, if you, you can look at it as immersed uh, in some Euclidean space, and if you look to the distance of the Euclidean space, on this Riemannian manifold, you get a distance which is not so meaningful, okay? Okay, if it is a geodesic space, then curve mu t, a, a family of curve, right? So a, a curve of measure mu t is a geodesic between mu zero and mu one, if and only if there exists a measure eta, which is a probability measure on the space of geodesic in X. Okay, so you have your, your, you have your space below, then you can construct, if you can look, uh, so ge geodesic of X is just a space of curve, and you can construct probability measure on this space of curve, okay? So you, you can think that this is like taking random curves, having a probability measure on the space of curves, okay? So you have a eta, which is a probability measure uh, on this space. Let me write down the statement. Such that what you need is that if you look, this is the evaluation map. So you have a... Um, Yeah, uh, this is, so ET is something which goes from the space of curves, say in this case, geodesic or absolutely continuous curve to X and to every curve it associates its value at time T, okay? So this is uh, the evaluation map. So this is a measure mu zero. This is the measure, our starting measure mu zero. At time one, you end up on mu one, and then, okay, let's say, and obviously mu t, which is our interesting curve, is just, okay, so probably this, in quote, all the three, and then you want that e zero, e one, so this is a coupling, of eta is just, is optimal, is optimal, it's an optimal plan. And as a consequence of all this, you get that the coupling is optimal between every two times. Okay. So, Moreover, in this case, you know exactly that the ET, ES, sharp, eta, which belongs, this is a coupling between mu T and mu S and is optimal. So what is the idea? I mean, you have your measure mu, you have your measure nu here, Okay, and the Kantorovich problem, an optimal plan is telling you how to couple this point in an optimal way, right? What is telling you this is that once you know that, you know also, I mean, you just have to take the geodesic 
between these two points, and this gives you a, a curves, I mean, this gives you a curves of measure, right? Because say that this point is going, is sent in that point, this point is sent in that point, and so on. Then you take geodesic and you look which is the picture of time t, right? You make just evolve your measure on one of the other and you move all particles along geodesic. And you look at picture time t. Well, what are you doing here is just to writing down a geodesic on the vast time space. Okay, so the geodesics in the space of measures is a measure on the space of geodesic. So you are just choosing among all possible geodesic the one which are given by this coupling. Okay? So and this is exactly as you as you make the proof of this theorem, which I don't probably have time to do. Just let me so I'll just give you an idea of the proof of the theorem and then then maybe it's I give you some uh, some application of these facts next lecture before coming back to the regularity issue so you need to construct this so say you know that mu t is a geodesic. And, uh, okay, just a previous remark before the proof. I will always look look to um, minimizing geodesic. Uh, sorry, to constant speed minimizing geodesic. Constant speed. Geodesic. And in general, uh, geodesic gamma is, is a constant speed minimizing geodesic if and only if uh, gamma is, uh, I don't know, constant speed minimizing geodesic if and only if uh, the distance square between gamma of t, gamma of s, is t minus s square distance square of gamma of 0, gamma of 1, if and only if uh, it holds with this inequality. Okay? And this is a nice exercise for you. So for every t and s. Okay, so you are a constant speed minimized in geodesics. So if and only if you are so subset, here you are saying that you are optimal among all two points in some sense, and you are you are saying the same. Okay, this is an easy exercise for you. So I have this geodesic. Now let's start. I have this measure eta on the which is a probability measure on the space of geodesic, and I know that mu t uh, is given by e t sharp eta, right? And I also know that if I look to the coupling given by the, by the extrema of this to of this geodesic, okay, this is uh, this is optimal. This is a plan which is optimal between mu, mu zero and mu one. Okay, and now I want to show that mu t is a geodesic, where mu t is given by that. Okay, so I start having a measure on the space of geodesic, knowing that the extrema the extremum point of this geodesic are optimal coupling, 
between mu zero and mu one, and I want to show that in some sense this is optimal for all the time. Okay, and this is pretty easy because I look, which is the vastest time distance a square between mu t and mu s. And this is just uh, less or equal than the integral e of x y. And here I can take e t e s sharp eta is a coupling between e t and e s. So since this is an interim, it's less than just testing with something. But then I just write down what is this. This is the integral of this, this square here, sorry. This is the integral of this square um, gamma t gamma s in the eta. Okay. But then I use this. I know that all these curves are geodesic because eta is a probability measure on the space of geodesic. So I know that all these curves are geodesic, so this is nothing else than t minus s squared, the integral of d square gamma of 0, gamma 1, in d eta gamma. But then this is just um, t minus s squared, the integral. Uh, the integral, what is this? This is d square xy in d e0, e1 sharp eta, by definition of push forward. And now I know that this is optimal. What does it mean that this is optimal? This just means that this is equal to the vastest n distance square between mu0 and mu1, right? And then you see that this inequality here is satisfied by this curve which means that these curves is a geodesic, okay? So in some sense, you, are in, you know that every curve satisfies that inequality and you are integrating on all these curves. So it's not it's pretty clear that this has to be true. And the point is, this point say that you know, so to prove the converse of the theorem, you have to know, you have to understand what happens. So you have a curve which you know is a geodesic. Time by time is a geodesic. Okay, and you want to construct a measure which is concentrated on the space of on the space of geodesic, and which is optimal between every two extrema. I mean, that's what we are asking, right? That any times you take any time you take two times on the but, uh, I mean two e t and uh, t and s, and you look. In some sense, you project your geodesic on the space, so you look which is the distribution of points at time t and at time s. You want that the coupling given by connecting this point with your geodesic is optimal for the Kantorovich problem. Okay? And so you have this mu t, and what are you going to do? I'm not going to give a complete proof, but just the intuition, because the proof, I mean, the proof is, it's easy because it's just behind this intuition, but then it's, um, boring stuff of measure theory, so I mean, you have to construct, I don't know if some one of you has uh, ever seen, I mean, I guess you have seen the construction of uh, Brownian motion, uh, and it's kind of the same. So what are you going to do? So you say you have mu zero and mu one, then look to mu one half, so what happens at the middle, right? And then you have, so your measures, so what are you going to do is like take uh, an optimal plan P12, which is an optimal plan between mu0 and mu1. P12, so let's call it this way. P0 one half is optimal between mu0 and mu1 half. So I know how to couple this point with some point here, right? So every x I can I know which are the y associates, where the, the mass is sent. And then do the same here. Uh, which is optimal in these two. And then you look 
you take a point to x, you say that you know that it's going to the point to, to a point y, and then uh, then you take the minimizing geodes geodesic between x and y. So you just decide the, which is the coupling on the point to throw the Kantorovich problem, right? Say that you know that you have a map. So you know that every x goes just to one y. Well, take that, that geodesic. Then you know that this y is going to some z here by this coupling. And take that other geodesic. Okay? And so on. So then you start dividing. You construct mu one fourth, then mu three fourth, and so on. And you still get, so say that now this point is better for, for him to go there, and say this goes still here. So, and this point will go there, and then there, and so on. So you are constructing, by discretizing time, you are constructing like uh, measures. So you, you take, uh, I mean, you take the induced measure on these curves, which are not exactly geodesic, but they are like, uh, uh, broken geodesic, right? They are geodesic on this interval, then they could broke and then, and so on. But since you know, in some sense, since you know that your curve was a geodesic on the space of measure, then you can prove that, I mean, in the limit, you are going to get a measure which is concentrated on geodesic, which is actually concentrated on geodesic, and such that mu t can be represented as you want. Okay, so this is the idea behind the proof, and I mean, you can find this proof, for instance, on the notes of uh, Ambrosio and Gigli, but the idea is this one. So ju you just discretize time, and then you look to the coupling given by Kantorovich problem, and you connect any two points which are capped by the Kantorovich problem with a geodesic. And then you take a measure, on, I mean, you take, uh, as measure on the space of geodesic, just the measure which sees this geodesic, and then you go. So say if you have two points, it's pretty easy, right? If you have a delta here, and one alpha delta here, one alpha delta here, so the measure is just given by uh, one half this curve, plus one half, so one alpha delta on this curve, and one alpha delta on this curve, right? And so on. So this is, so you know that this point will be sent one half here, one half here, you take the optimal curve from going from here to here, you take one half of that plus one half of that, okay? Okay. <coughs>